So hello, and welcome to another episode of Flying High with Flutter. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. I'm doing things a little bit differently today. Usually we do video, but um, at GoSim Conference 2024, what year is it? I always forget what it year is it is. It is 2024, yeah. Last <laughs> uh, I checked. In Beijing, and I ran into Kevin Moore. So this conference I heard was something like, uh, I know they have a big rush track, but suddenly I see Flutter on there. And I see it in Kevin Moore, and I'm like, wait a minute, I know this name. Kevin, why don't you just maybe quickly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Kevin Moore. I'm a product manager on the Flutter and Dart team at Google. December, I'll be there 11 years, all on the Dart and Flutter team. And that's important to bring up because I think maybe just something with the translation in China. Everyone seems to think that I run the whole team. I do not. There are people who are paid more that are more diligent than I am that run things. I am a product manager, which means I kind of handle strategy and just kind of overall planning for the web aspects of Flutter and Dart. So our JavaScript compilers, our new WebAssembly compiler, our integration with browser APIs, with JavaScript interop, and Flutter support for the web. So that's kind of the, the set of things I care about. And then I'm always interested to talk to people about server stuff and our package ecosystem. I have lots of interests. One of the questions I had is, are you actually coding day in there? Because you say product manager. My understanding of product manager is more like, you know, managing the project and doing stuff that a PM would do. Not necessarily coding, but are you actually coding? <laughs> I code probably more than I should. Yeah. Um, there was a joke on my bio for a while, these speaking engagements, where I joked that I'd rather be coding. So no, I bootstrapped a few projects that are still kind of actively used. I probably code a bit every day, but mostly I'm kind of in, you know, docs and emails and meetings and, you know, more of that kind of stuff, strategy stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just kind of curious, uh, how much of your day do you think you spend coding? On average, probably 30 minutes a day. Okay. But there's like, you know, what usually will happen is I'll like, I usually check the commits and actually recommend people that are interested in open source or Flutter in general, like go look at the commits every day. Like you can go to the GitHub repository and just look at commits and see what's flying through. If you have a Git GUI, it makes things much easier. I use something called Source Tree, which I think is by Atlassian yeah. and it's free and it works pretty well. And there's other GUIs, but um, it's a great way to just kind of get yourself more familiar. I think for a lot of people, it might be kind of like reading an academic paper, which is, you know, if you look at the Dart SDK, for instance, there's a lot of C++ that comes flying through. You're like, oh, they're working on risk stuff. And then you see some of the Dart code that goes into the analyzer or into some of our compilers. And I'm amazed kind of what you pick up doing that. So um, I don't think enough people kind of leverage the power of Git and the fact that the whole history is there. So, you know, I'm looking at code, certainly looking at code every day. And, you know, it basically, I think maybe once a week, I'll get sucked into something for a few hours to hack on something, which is, it's good and fun. But you've been working with Dart, I think, pre-Flutter, no? Yeah, I worked on Dart before there was a Flutter. I worked on Dart before I worked at Google. I was a GDE, gosh, it was like 2012, I think I started, mm -hmm. or 20, I think 2012. I joined Google in 2013. I haven't had this confirmed yet. I think I was one of the first people paid to write Dart code that didn't work at Google because I did some early consulting for Google before I, before I joined. There's a game, if you look for Pop Pop Win, is a DOM-based, not Flutter-based, it's purely DOM-based, game, it's basically Minesweeper, but with darts, and you throw any pop balloons. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that, I think, in 2011 or 2012. If you go look at the first commit, like the syntax for Dart has changed a lot since then. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like one of the first things I wrote, and I, I keep maintaining it, like, you know, making sure it works with new language features and everything else. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty interesting. So, it, I mean, you saw Dart, you know, from, I mean, I guess when you start looking at Dart, because Dart has been some kind of Google internal project, and I'm not sure when it kind of opened up to the outside world. We just had the 13th birthday of Dart. I think the week, yeah, before I flew out here, so last week we celebrated Dart's, we joked that Dart is uh, a teenager now Yeah. in terms of its first public announcement. So it went through a couple internal things and some code names. Actually, if you're uh, familiar, Dash is the name of our stuffy, kind of our mascot. Yeah. Dash was the code name for Dart. Oh, is for, that where the name Dash basically came from yes. for the mascot? And there's okay. legal reasons and other silliness where they're like, Somewhere Google has like a pile of code of names that like yeah. have passed muster. We bought companies and they have things. I think that's actually the, the origin of Flutter too, which was mm. this is kind of what we have, mm -hmm. and like they go into the vault of things that Google owns, and that's where they found Dart. But I like Dart and Flutter a lot. So Dash, right? Like my understanding about Dash is it seems like it's always been a Flutter mascot. Now is that been hijacked or what? No, 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 no. Maybe that's um, the wrong thing to say. But oh, I mean, it, it seems... was never hijacked. I mean, so the code name for Dart beforehand was Dash. The code yeah. name for Flutter is Sky. In yes. fact, if you look at the source code, you still see Sky Engine. And then at some point, someone did like a rebrand of Dart or like was playing with logos. And we had this like very angular, ha, um, very like, you know, it's angular looking um, uh, hummingbird logo. 
And then one of the writers on our team, Shams, who's spectacular, her actually first day at Google was my first day at Google. We joined the same day. She was like, we need to have a mascot. And so she took this very angular, you know, with right edges, flutter hummingbird mascot and threw it to some designers and like, what can you come up? And it came out with this kind of very mm -hmm. round, jovial, something that you would be much easier to stuff if you're going to have like a, a plushy kind of thing. And so we decided that Dash would be a great name for this bird. So that's where the... So you're already looking at merchandise. God bless Shams. She's like, we need to have a cool mascot because Go oh, yeah. had the gopher and, you know, there's the, the, I don't know what the flame logo is for Firebase. She's like, we need to have yeah. a cool mascot. And so someone, you know, that was her vision. So I think if you do flutter.dev slash dash, I think, which is always a fun thing. There, if you search for like, there's a whole history of Dash as a mascot. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, I always associate Dash with Flutter. So if Dash is more so with Dart, it's just interesting well, to Oh, to see. so yeah, as a mascot, it's kind of, it's it's the mascot for the whole team. So Dart and Flutter. We're yeah. all kind of together now. So it's well, a shared mascot. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. This leads into a question I asked you yesterday when we ran into each other, which is about the, because we didn't talk about this topic before, right? How basically Dart and Flutter are released at the same time, mm -hmm. which, as I mentioned to you, my concern is I don't necessarily like that because I feel like that doesn't let Dart be its own product. Oh, but yeah. But then you're saying that, no, actually, this is better. And so actually, I want to hear more about how you say that this is actually more helpful for it's, Dart itself. It ends up being logistically really convenient. So Dart was around first. It was mostly targeted on the web, you know, and there's an interesting history there. We can get into it if you... And then we Flutter can definitely talk about that because I, I'm aware because Sky was all about a web thing. It's weird. It's like it's like they started doing like a web framework and then like they pulled back to mobile and then web came back. Well, it wasn't even a framework. So my favorite, I think I've talked about this a few times, but I think the history is interesting. When I joined Google again, it's like 11 years ago, there were so many crazy, I don't know if it's like crazy, but just very out there, aggressive things being done in the Chrome organization. So around that time, they were looking at WebP as, as you know, media formats, working on HTTP2 and HTTP3. Those started out with code names Speedy and Quick, and there's fun acronyms for them, but, yeah. um, you know, drastically improving <laughs> the networking stack. I mean, HTTP 1.1 has been around for 15 years, and then in the span of five, Google, again, with partners and standardized, pushed out two updates to the standard. It's like like Speedy needed, and something else. Speedy right? and Quick. Quick. That was HTTP2 and then HTTP3, I yeah. think. I mean that right. You know, there was a notion of Chrome apps, which again, kind of like evolved into... PWAs and progressive web apps and a bunch of technologies there. We had a thing called NACL, Native Client, which was a, basically a way to run native assembly code in the browser. And of course, that kind of inspired discussions around what became ASM.js. And of course, ASM.js ended up inspiring folks at Mozilla, Luke Wagner, among others. We'll talk about WASM in a bit, I think, to push WebAssembly. And so at that same time, all these crazy things are happening. I mean, this is when Chromecast came out, like Chrome was doing all these things. Yeah. And around that time, there was two efforts. One was the folks that did the V8 engine. They're like, we could do this a lot more efficiently if we didn't have to target JavaScript. Like JavaScript just has, it's an amazing language, an amazing flexible language, but there's just a bunch of kind of idiosyncrasies of JavaScript that make it, you can't squeeze out all the perf you could compared to yeah. C or C++ or even Java. And so that was the genesis of Dart. Like we do something fundamentally better there. And then likewise, the Sky team, what became Flutter, they were doing a very similar thing kind of at the DOM level, which was there's just a bunch of things in the DOM around how layout was handled and a bunch of other things. And they're like, if we simplify this and start with some better assumptions, we can make things much more flexible and much faster. And so both projects started out as very forward-looking ways to reimagine how the web would work. And then the irony for both is we both left the Chrome organization, went different ways. Flutter, of course, chose Dart as a programming language in runtime, which was spectacular. And then just in the last several years, I, guess I, I, I lose track, but, you know, at some point in the last five years, we merged together. And so now we have a shared product management team. There's still kind of two, you know, engineering split up between Flutter and Dart under two directors, but we work really closely together. And yeah. so it really gets down to logistics. Like there's folks, there's a lot of folks who use just Dart and are very happy with Dart for a lot of reasons. But because we work so closely together and we really want to, you know, a lot of the features we work on with Dart are about improving Flutter and improving the story with Flutter. It makes things much easier for us to release together. Like we don't have to have two separate release trains or worry about coordinating things. In fact, what's really nice is Flutter is always building against a very recent version of Dart. So okay. you can actually look at how we're like merging <clears throat> over branches. Yeah. And so Dart gets the benefit of that. You know, any changes we do to the analyzer or the language or the VM, they're all just really seriously battle tested 
but the latest version of Flutter. So it really keeps the quality of Dart really high. And then it's just much easier to communicate. Like we come out with features and everything together. So obviously you can still download Dart as a standalone SDK. Like um, if you do a Docker container, it's like probably a great example there. Like there's no Flutter there. It's just pure Dart. But most of our users are Flutter users. So it's a much more logistically easy thing when you think about blogging and you know doing release announcements, like having it all together, I think just makes, it's just efficiency. The only problem that I can see happening with this, I do see, you know, how this stuff could be positive, but now the negative part, right, is now there could be a concern like, okay, Dart is its own thing. It's still releasable, et cetera, right? But now they're brought together, right? But does this mean that Flutter can now start to dictate to Dart how it should be? Because, you know, like, I, I think I've heard recently people talking about, like, upstreaming stuff. But just like, like, okay, so there's a specific Rust track here, and I'm deeply working with the Rust people over here. And I often hear some people asking the Rust team to start adding more to the standard library. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you also mentioned too, is that there's some stuff from Flutter that you think should be in Dart itself. There's some classes I think you were talking oh, about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the, to start now, with- That can be a little bit dangerous too, right? Because if one project starts influencing a language, that may take it so that that language no longer is maybe a general purpose language. It's possible, but oh, sure. maybe not. I think just the nature of our products and how we use Dart, <laughs> there's a couple levels there. First is, it's great to have like a primary customer you worry yeah. about making happy. like. And I'm sure Rust does this too. I don't know how they manage it, but it's a tricky thing, right? When you have many, many masters, like how do you prioritize? Like, you know, which way do you go? And like, it's easy to kind of get scatter shot, right? In terms of going many directions at once. And so the fact that like, you know, Dart's primary concern is making sure we're a great language for Flutter. I don't think it's a bad thing. It keeps us really focused and it gives us a set of things to worry about and work yeah. on. But to pile on top of that, I think this is also good to point out is all the tooling around Flutter and Dart is also, or a lot of it is written in Dart as well. So... Yeah. We have two JavaScript compilers, both written in Dart. Our WASM compiler is written in Dart. Our analyzer is written in Dart. The common front end, which actually runs in the VM, is sourced in Dart, and then we pre-compile it to a native library that's used in the VM. So like a big part of the VM that runs Dart code is actually sourced in Dart code, and we share that with the analyzer and with the formatter and the other compilers. And so, you know, having a language, you know, think about the CLI for all those things, for the analyzer, for pub.dev, our package site is all written in Dart. We have a lot of things that are kind of pushing in Dart in different directions, like running, you know, CLI apps, running servers, running services, you know, dev tools is all written in Dart. And so that kind of keeps us honest, I think. Like, you need to make sure that all those systems keep working really well and are efficient with memory and start up fast and, and all those things. So it's a good concern. And I'm excited about using Dart in other places besides Flutter. But I think, you know, the relationship generally has worked out pretty well. Yeah, it has. It's just something I'm always in the back of my mind. But as a programmer, you always have to think about well, what about this case, this case, this oh, case, yeah, yeah. you know. I can never stop wondering. Now, another follow-up question about this now is if Dart can do this and can do that, what is it? You know, what kind of language is it? I mean, with C, C++, you're not really going to be writing stuff on the front end. Of course, WASM, which we'll talk more about later on. Yeah. You can use different languages. But it seems like Dart could be run in so many cases. Like, it, first, it's kind of came up as like a way to kind of replace JavaScript or have a more efficient way of running Code JavaScript. In the browser. Like, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the browser. And then now it has, you know, it's, it's got AOT ahead of time compilation and you can get native out of it. I mean, you're writing like... We have a so, VM story. You can compile to a native binary and just run it head, like standalone, which is cool. So it's like, what is it? Like, how do you explain to somebody what it is? Because JavaScript is like, okay, it's a interpreted language. It doesn't really get compiled to native code necessarily. Right. Not ahead of time. You know, I mean, with an asterisk, is, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, you know, obviously when you run in a browser, that's the crazy thing. Even uh, scripting languages, you know, eventually they all end up running natively, right? Like JIT is the yeah. way it's done, right? Yeah. Whether it's C Sharp or Java or JavaScript. The tagline for Dart, I should have it memorized. I don't, but like it's meant as like, you know, an object-oriented general purpose language for building apps <laughs> on any system. And so object-oriented, obviously, you know, it's kind of a classically object-oriented language. So obviously Rust has had a lot of success with trait-based model and like we're unapologetically object-oriented. There's a lot of functional things that we think are really useful in Dart. And so obviously, you know, functions are first-class citizens and you can pass functions around and do lambdas and tear-offs and all those things. So, you know, trying to take the best of object-oriented and the best of kind of a functional style language. You know, I can go down the list of like superlatives, like the fact yeah. that we're soundly typed is really a big deal. The fact that we're soundly typed and null safe. I mentioned that in my talk yesterday, I think is super helpful. And we're always looking to improve, you know, whether it's uh, targeting new platforms, you know, it's cool seeing, you know, Risk v being supported and people starting to target Risk v WebAssembly, we just added that as a compile target in the last year, stable, and seeing where that's going. So we're kind of always growing the set of things that we're targeting. So, 
you know, I think we have a good base where it's clear what you're getting when you're getting into Dart. You know, it's meant to be really familiar for anyone who's done JavaScript or C or C++ or Java or Kotlin, you know, syntactically. You know, we want it to be both user-friendly and also really high performance, which is a tricky balance to have, but I think we're doing an okay job. Yeah, I have to say that it feels like out of all languages I've looked at, Dart's done a lot of changes, especially recently with, I start off pre-sound no safety, mm -hmm. right? And so that came in, I was like, this is nice because I was already looking and playing around with Rust at the time. So I was like, this is looking interesting. And then recently, well, I mean, recent is, is quite a big word, but what's it called? Pattern matching and seal classes. Oh, that was still this year. Yeah, yeah. Records. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it depends on what recent years, is for you, yeah, right? Yeah. Relative for this kind of language, it's actually moving quite quick. But I'm saying like all these features, it's like, yes, yes, yes. These guys are actually doing stuff that's really useful, really interesting. And it feels like they're taking stuff that I like in other languages and they're bringing it in, which is good to see. And it's not, looks like, I mean, you've definitely looked at Java before, right? Of like course. When Java yeah. added in this Lambda stuff, like they try to add in more functional things to it. It just looks and feels weird, you know? I can't really speak to the Java stuff. I haven't spent much time. The last time I really did anything serious in Java was college. So it's been a while since I've written yeah. any Java seriously. I do feel like we're in a really fun place where it seems like there's just lots of playing off each other and learning things from other languages. Swift, I think, for example, has some interesting ideas around... Like if I know I'm passing an argument into a function or a, a method and I know it's an enum type, it's like I shouldn't have to restate the enum name. I should just be able to do dot value and have it be, it's, and you can infer it, right? Yeah. And so like even things like that, like, oh, could we do that as a language feature? Like, and so I think that's great being in kind of the open source world. Like there's lots of very quick iteration back and forth between things. It's clear also that, you know, I think personally, I'm not speaking for the team or for Google, but like. It also seems that like Java has kind of seen what Kotlin's been doing. It's like, oh, we should like pick up the pace here. And Java's doing some really cool evolution lately. So I think it's a good time to be a programmer. There's lots of really good options. What I want to say is when Dar's adding these features, they're not just adding them in. Like I said, when I was working with Java, it felt like that was kind of bolted on. Oh, and, yeah. And even I was explained to by a seasoned programmer who's really into Java and promotes it and crazy about it. He also was like, well, the other languages have it. And so they needed to add it. Like his explanation, this is his explanation, right? Yeah. It's not like the, the explanation is like, it's kind of the trend and people see the, the benefit of using functional features. And so that's why it's been added into Java. And yes, it doesn't look and feel nice, but oh, at least it works. But that was his explanation to me. This is why. I mean, I, again, I can't speak to Java so much. I can say that we have a pretty big language team. Yeah. And they do other things. I think it's like six or eight people now. What kind of language team? Super smart people. And they take their time. And I think there's some other things too. You know, especially thinking about, you know, I've, I've mentioned this about Kotlin and TypeScript as well, which is, you know, TypeScript has evolved very quickly and added lots of cool features. It is fundamentally limited by what JavaScript offers, right? Like there's no, I think there are people playing with, you know, TypeScript runtimes, but pretty much it's like, you know, JavaScript defines what's sound and what's allowed and that's the restriction. And the Kotlin can be also very similar too, right? Like there's obviously work about kind of extending Kotlin to other places and Kotlin native, some really fun and interesting things happening there. But you are limited to what kind of what the Java ecosystem allows, what's considered sound or valid in the Java world. Yeah. And, you know, Dart, we have some things, you know, you can do AOT and you can do snapshots, but we really don't have anything where we promise compatibility over long term. Yeah. The one thing we've done since uh, 2.12 when we did no safety is we have this notion of a language version, which kind of restricts the features we let you have access to. So your package has to say, I'm opting into language feature whatever, by saying my lower bound is 3.5. And so now you can have access to any new feature that's 3.5 or before if you set your lower bound. So having that model and having that model where, we, you know, the artifact we deploy is source code. So it's not jar files or DLLs or anything else. It's given us a lot of flexibility. And so we're trying to be very mindful about kind of breaking changes and how we evolve things. And we're trying to stay right in the middle because there are platforms out there that, you know, you could take a compiled you know, a jar file or a class file or a DLL or something. And I was like, oh, 10 years later, it still runs. Like, you know, we don't make those promises. We don't have those assets, right? It's all Dart source files. But the benefit of kind of trying to find a middle ground is that we can move pretty quickly and we're not super limited by legacy. And that's a really big thing. So we can take a step back and be thoughtful about how we add features and hopefully not make them seem like they're too bolted on. I know there's a lot of work in null safety and thinking about the migration there and how packages can evolve and like opt into features. And we had a mixed mode for a while, but a lot of that was, you know, we need to make sure we can bring the ecosystem along with us, 
but also realizing that there's lots of benefits to, you know, trying to keep your foot on the gas mindfully and pulling people along with you because then you still have a fresh ecosystem and a fresh language by trying to find a good balance between backwards compatibility and future look. I guess we'll see how it turns out. I think it, it works pretty well. I'm always interested to hear what our community thinks. Sam, I'm very happy with it, but kind of moving on. So macros, right? What's the story with macros? And I mean, we're still cranking on it. That's the folks driving most of the work are in Seattle in the office that I'm at, which is great. So I, I can kind of hear what's going on. You know, I was excited to demo those at IO this year in May 2024. We're still refining the feature. Um, There's some related stuff. We talked about, you know, how do you define the asset that contains, you know, the augmented classes? So we've introduced this notion of augmentation. And we're going to have these things called augmentation libraries. And now we're basically calling it enhanced parts as a feature for Dart that not many people use. So, you know, there's always kind of iteration going on in terms of how the feature is defined. And actually, forgive me, let me back up a second for those that don't know. So macros is Dart's implementation of metaprogramming. It's a fun grammatical lesson. You know, so what is metaprogramming? It's programs that write programs. There is some stuff in the Dart ecosystem right now that lets you do something like this. It's it's called the build package or build runner. That was actually, I had a big part in building that, which makes me sad because a lot of people will bring up build runner as like this horrible thing. And, you know, again, I worked with very smart, thoughtful engineers working on it. And, you know, my explanation is that it's the best thing we could have without building it into Dart itself. Yeah. So what's the fastest, most efficient thing we could do without adding it to the language? And that's what Build Runner was, you know, and obviously that drives JSON serializable and freezed and a bunch of other uh, projects where people want to write code that writes Dart code. And so macros is going to be the implementation that actually is built into the Dart language. And it'll be built into our compilers. It'll be built into the analyzer and should really make metaprogramming super efficient. We have a short link, so you can go kind of go see what the current status is. We don't have any announcements. I don't have any announcements today around a release timeline. I know that there's smart people spending a lot of time evolving it. One thing we really want to be careful about is this is one of those features that you don't want to get wrong. Yeah. Like if we ship macros and there's something horribly wrong about performance or soundness or something flaky, you know, if people start building on it and betting on it, ripping it out or changing it's really hard. It touches every aspect of the Dart language and the analyzer and everything else. And so we're going slowly and thoughtfully. The idea is if, if we take our time here, it'll be something that really shows dividends for years and decades. So yeah. I'd say, you know, keep an eye out for it. There's people in the community already building packages that play with the experimental feature. I'd probably say be careful about using any of that in production, but certainly try it out and we're excited to get feedback. So you have any idea how close we are or I'd have to go check out what the I, current status is? I know better than to guess, but I would say, you know, <laughs> we have uh, public assets that describe it. I think if you just search for Dart macros, you know, uh, Google cool. will give you a good result. You know, and if you're listening to this much later than October 2024, you know, we might have announced something, but we're working on it hard and we're excited about it. The next thing I have to ask, it's also related to Dart uh, as a target, right? Is You also touched on it too, is, is WASM, right? Yes. Maybe you can quickly explain what is WASM? Sure. I think we talked a little bit about it. Yeah, it's WebAssembly. And so, again, it's the history of kind of, you know, Google did some experiments here. And then it was, to, you know, some folks at Mozilla kind of ran with the idea. And obviously, Google's implementation was never really, I don't think was ever really pushed as a standard thing. But the idea was, you know, there's lots of folks using JavaScript as a compilation target. And certainly TypeScript is probably the most popular example. But even before TypeScript, there was Coffee, I think was something I, or Coffee script. script. Yeah. yeah, I mean, going back over 15 years ago now. The weird thing about CoffeeScript is a lot of people loved it, and all of a sudden, people started hating it suddenly. And like, even Google had it was called a Java Web Toolkit, GWT, um, uh, Google G Web Toolkit. Yeah. And that was Java. There's a thing that let you do Java to JavaScript. And then there's the Clojure compiler, which was heavily annotated type JavaScript, where you define types in annotations, like in comment sections, and then you'd compile it, and it would, you know, you get type checking from the compiler, and it could optimize things and do tree shaking and other things. So there's been lots of history, you know, over 15 years now of targeting JavaScript. And it just turns out, like, there's lots of things about JavaScript that make it a good compilation target. It's very flexible. But, I mean, actually, it's surprising. In some contexts, especially with a good jitting runtime, like V8 or the other the JavaScript runtimes, you can, in some cases, get really close to native performance with JavaScript. But your initial run is rarely that fast because you have to warm up the JIT and it has to learn how the code runs. And... One of the big problems is, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in JavaScript where the 10,000th time through the loop, someone might change the prototype on a class effectively. And so to make sure you're always valid as a JavaScript runtime, you have to keep all these checks around. 
And of course, there's other things like the numbers in JavaScript. There's no real integer type. It's all double. And so you can treat JavaScript numbers like integers as long as you're like 53 bits or below. But beyond that, like you start getting rounding with floating point numbers. And, and the so, string is also like UTF-16 or something really weird. You're like, what? Yeah, there's some very interesting Whoa. history there. Yeah. It'd be much easier if everything was UTF-8, right? And so the idea of WebAssembly was like, what's the simplest possible assembly language like thing? And it's three goals. It's performance. So give a basis that can be optimized really well across architectures, which is the second one, portable. So it will run on, you know, 32-bit cores and 64-bit cores and x86 and ARM and RISC and anything else. It runs really well and secure. And so there's just a bunch of stuff. The beautiful thing about when you instantiate a WASM module is all you have access to is the memory you give it. And that is it. And you pass in arguments and get arguments out. The base implementation is just numbers, integers and doubles. And then if you want to give your WASM runtime or module access to stuff, you have to explicitly hand it to it. So if I run a JavaScript script in the context of a browser, I can go grab the global object and do whatever I want, right? It's kind of willy-nilly. There has been some work to lock that down, but generally like an arbitrary JavaScript script can do anything at once. And in WASM, it can do only the things you hand to it. And also there's other things, my understanding is there's a bunch of other stuff around how the assembly is defined and then how it's validated to make sure that it's just very secure. So portability, performance, and security are the three things, which are, you know, at times often at heads, but to have a model for that that's successful is really unprecedented. And so it's been around for, you know, gosh, six years now or five. It hasn't been that long, frankly. And it's taken over. Like, this is how a lot of people are doing large language model stuff on the web. With WebAssembly, this is how Google Earth runs its globe, you know, Photoshop, Autodesk. There's a bunch of apps that can target WebAssembly now, native applications that can run on the web. And so we we're excited in the last year, we announced that Dart now supports targeting WebAssembly. And the missing piece, of course, was that WebAssembly by default didn't have any native support for garbage collection and for garbage collected language. There are some other languages, I think C-sharp and some implementations of Go, basically compiled their own garbage collector and shipped it as part of the WebAssembly module. It makes it quite big, right? It makes your modules really big. You're limited in performance, like in yeah. your ability to interrupt with the code. So we're waiting for you know, folks in the standards bodies. You know, We talked a lot with folks in the Chrome team and others. We filed some bug at some point against Firefox and like the Kotlin folks followed up with a follow-on, like they saw the same bug. It's cool to be in bug trackers with all these other companies and teams. But yeah, as of a year ago now, October of 2023, WASM GC shipped in Chrome. It's also shipped in Firefox. Safari has a tech preview out with WASM GC. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot more programming languages targeting WebAssembly, especially all the GC languages. And we've seen spectacular results. The example I was going to give, I think just this next release coming out, our next uh, Flutter and Dart release, our DevTools, you can now opt into using WebAssembly in DevTools and across a number of benchmarks, 2x faster like just free performance. And so we've been working on JavaScript compilers from Dart for over 10 years. And obviously the browser, V8 and other browsers have been optimizing their JavaScript runtimes for over a decade now. And the fact that you can just walk in and take the exact same app, just pre recompile it to WebAssembly. Our WebAssembly compiler is less than you know a couple years old. The WASM runtimes are half the age of the JS runtimes. And across all these places, just to get 2x performance for free is amazing. Like we're really getting close to native performance on the web for this. And so aside from the portability stuff that's awesome and the security aspects that are really cool, I'm really seeing it as the future of people building web experiences because you're now really getting close to native performance on the browser with all the benefits of the browser. You don't have to install the app and it's really secure and sandboxed. That's an exciting place to be, to be working on. You gave a lot of glowing talk about WebAssembly, right? Because then people may be thinking, okay, if that's the truth, then why don't we write and do everything WebAssembly? Why are people still writing plain JavaScript? Why all? Because there's some cases where WebAssembly doesn't work well, as well as, you know, say JavaScript, such as DOM manipulation, as we just talked about, right? Yeah, and strings. There's a bunch of stuff there. Obviously, the, you know, the browser and the browser APIs really kind of grew up with JavaScript and working with JavaScript. So all the types are kind of JavaScript types if you look at the IDL format that defines a web APIs. And so there's still a bunch of work, you know, to be done there. You know, an interesting example is JSON decode. So obviously the browser does an amazingly efficient job decoding, you know, strings into basically JavaScript objects, right? That's yeah. the name. JSON, if you didn't know, it's JavaScript <laughs> object notation, like JavaScript literals is kind of the origin of it. And so when we try to run that same code, but we're instantiating Dart objects in the WASM heap, in the WASM runtime, 
it's quite a bit slower, at least our default implementation. And we found a bunch of ways we can improve it. We've done some optimization, but just things like string manipulation, like there is a string in JavaScript that's really efficient and been optimized over many, many years. And WASM itself doesn't have a fundamental notion of a string type. There's byte arrays and you can encode and decode, you know, UTF-8 or UTF-16 into a byte array in WebAssembly, but you lose a lot of the optimization that exists already for like things like JS string. And then if you're sending strings back and forth, from WebAssembly to JavaScript, you need to encode and decode the string in both directions. This is just, you know, I think growing pains. Like there's a proposal out now, I think, I don't know if it's called JS string or string interop or something similar, but it's basically how can we send a string like object into WebAssembly and do that really efficiently. So it's just, you know, as the ecosystem is pushing WebAssembly and doing more interesting things in WebAssembly, these problems are coming up and we're solving the problems. And so strings is one example where there's some work to be done. I continue to be super optimistic that like those things will be resolved. The standards bodies are moving really quickly and thoughtfully on things. As with anything in software, like of course benchmark it first. Like don't deploy your Flutter web app with WebAssembly without testing it first to make sure that it covers all the cases you care about. But I definitely recommend trying it out because chances are you'll be really happy. We did talk a little bit yesterday about hot code reload on web, right? Because you're yes. mostly working on the web. Yeah, yeah, the team is working really hard on hot reload. There's a few features that we're missing on the web that people are really excited about. And, and keep reminding me about that, like, where's hot reload? So we have a team actively working on that and we're making good progress. Again, I don't have any timelines or anything other than yeah. we have smart people. We have more than one person. I forget on a given day how many engineers are working on hot reload, but it's more than one. It shifts around a little bit. But yeah, it's an interesting place where Obviously, doing hot reload in the Dart VM, I'm not going to pretend it was easy. It was a very hard problem. Yeah. But we own the VM. So like it makes things more straightforward. We can get down to the nuts and bolts at runtime to swap things around. And of course, when we're running on the web, we're laying on what is happening with you know, JS Core or with V8, you know, the JavaScript runtimes. And so it actually turns out that JavaScript is actually an easier target for hot reload than WebAssembly for that very reason. For all the reasons that I talked about earlier about JS being a bad target because it could be loosey-goosey, you can change things at runtime, which makes it hard to get maximum performance out, but it actually gives you the flexibility you want to do things like hot reload. So I think there was some discussion and investigation of seeing if we could do hot reload in WebAssembly. And at least now, it's like not the target we're taking. So the dev compiler, which is the development compiler you use for Dart to JavaScript, we're adding hot reload there. Again, talking about looking at the source code, like you can go look at the Dart SDK and look at the commits. And there's a bunch of commits flying through on hot reload. And you know, as soon as it's ready for folks to try out, you will see me you know, tweeting about it on Mastodon and threads and everywhere else talking about it. Because I think it's going to be a really nice solution for folks. Yeah, because I think most of the people are just doing native development, then when they need to go test it on web, and they just right. test it on web, which is not optimal, but I can understand. It's just... And of course, if you have a web yeah. experience you're building and you're using web packages and talking to web APIs, like it might not be easy to do a native shim for it, right? Or you have to mock out all the API calls. So yeah. we totally understand the benefits of having hot reload on the web natively, and we're working on it and we're optimistic. It's good. It's interesting at the conference, you know, everyone's like, well, what's the future of Flutter and what's coming along? And I have an interesting perch being inside, seeing what everything's working on, but we do work really hard to kind of work out in the open. And so again, if you're looking at, you know, we have a language repository for Dart, you can see the work going on there. I had a conversation today and I think I mentioned to you, like, you know, we're investigating improving multi-threading in Dart for a bunch of reasons. Like right now on the native side, Android and iOS, for the most of the part, when you're calling into the native APIs, they have to be asynchronous calls because you're not guaranteed to be running on the same thread. Or generally, yeah. actually, you're not running on the same thread. And so that just makes coding and doing interop much more difficult. You know, you can't take the, just the signature of API calls as they exist on the target platform. You have to wrap them and make them asynchronous. It just makes things inefficient. And so there's a bunch of work going on now to basically offer the flexibility to offer something more similar to what you get from languages like C Sharp and Java in terms of being able to do multi-threaded coding. I think I'll give you the link to look at the language proposal. So again, it's not been implemented. There's experiments and there's a design iteration happening now, but we're really looking hard and basically making it much easier to do multi-threaded coding. The other really cool thing that relates back to WASM is a bunch of the work we're doing on the multi-threaded work also aligns with some proposals going on in the WASM world. Again, not implemented, but being discussed. So hopefully whatever model we end up with for improved multi-threading in Dart will also be seamlessly available in WebAssembly as well. You can't ever bring it back to JavaScript because of the way JavaScript is built. 
but you know we're thinking really far ahead there and just trying to give people flexibility again always trying to squeeze out can we get closer to native performance can we make it much easier to interop with native code and there's lots of cool stuff coming down the road let's kind of roll back a little bit about multi-threading right because we already have this i remember when i first started working on dart it's like well, you don't have threads but you have isolates yep and to me, isolates are nice because actually I'm used to working with a program language called Elixir, which is built upon yep. Erlang, which is what I was told is actually inspired the idea of isolates within Dart, which you're shaking your head yes, so I'm not remembering yeah. wrong. I don't mind, but I'm fine with that. I like isolates now. But how does that relate to multi-threading? Because basically you can spin up an isolate and you have to have some kind of schedule or something that runs all the different isolates. Right. So there's some very quippy thing about like, you know... I mean, not sharing memory is not a huge deal. There's like message pass with a channel. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you don't send messages by sharing memory. You share memory by passing messages. There's there's some clever quip. I forget what language it is. Every processor isolate in this case would have its own memory, right? And they only share data by sending a copy of it to... Right. And there's been actually some interesting work there. Um, I forget what version of Dart. It was in the last year. There is a notion of isolate groups now. And there are notions... You can share memory, right? across. And what you can do is you can spin up an isolate and then... If the isolate terminates with a return value, then the return value is just merged into the target's heap. And so you don't have to do copies. So there's been a okay. bunch of work basically trying to further improve our model. So let me back up a little bit. So yes, obviously futures and streams give you concurrency, which is great, especially if you're doing IO. Maybe we should talk about concurrency versus parallelism because oh gosh, we're gonna get our yes. <laughs> no, I mean, people it's, still get confused. I've been Talked out of my ear about this stuff, so I'm pleased. Yeah, yeah. and go ahead. You're putting me on the spot to make sure I, I get it correctly because it's it's tricky. You know, obviously we're used to imperative code that just runs linearly, right? So I call a function. The function I might call, you know, I might call into many nested functions or recursive functions. But there's one line of execution. I call. It goes down a stack. The stack rolls up. I get a return value. It exits, right? Yeah. So the concurrency is the ability to have multiple things happening at the same time. And so the way you do that in Dart and a lot of languages is there's an event loop. Well, I think you're, I think you're describing parallelism. But you well, need no, concurrency is... in order to have parallelism, right? Because there, there's separate pieces of work that can be run in parallel. Right. So the concurrency aspect is just like I could have many actions in flight at once, which is really nice. But you can still all do that in single thread. You know, that's how multi-threading works, right? Okay, yeah. Or that's, how, that's how you do task sharing on a system, right? Is that okay, you can have multiple, yeah. you know, the CPU can switch what it's working on. Mm-hmm. Back and yeah. forth, and it seems like a thousand things are happening at once. Like, no, there's one CPU, one core doing one bit of work, but it switches so fast that it seems like many things are happening. You and I probably grew up at the same time, right? Where, like, you know, until the late 90s, like, we, there was only one core. You yeah. Know, kids these days are spoiled with their 20 cores and their 40 yeah, cores. Yeah, I remember Core 2 Duo. I was like, this is really interesting. Having two, yeah. <laughs> and so just having a notion of concurrency, which is I can, you know, spin up asynchronous work. In our in Dart's case, they, these are futures, and then they get scheduled later, and I will get called back. And so I can say, I want to read this file. I will say, you know, go read bytes into this file, and then I return. And it, you know, even if there's only one core or one thread, I can go and like something else can go fill that buffer up, and I can go do other work, and then I'll get an event. And so when my event loop ends, I'll get some other event that comes up, and that's when the yeah. future dot then happens. And now I have my buffer filled, reading from the disk or reading from the network, like all these things. And so that is the ability to do concurrency, which is again, a lot of work in flight, even if it's only a single thread. Parallelism is the other thing, right? Which is like yeah. I want to use the fact that I have multiple cores on my device to get things done, and that gets really tricky because now you have to worry about you know. If I'm updating a counter, like, or some number, like, many threads could be touching that number at the same time. So it's a classic, like, banking transaction thing, right? Which yeah. is, if I am withdraw money or add money, you know, like, there's a point in time where I could double add or double withdraw, like, it gets tricky. So then you have to have synchronization primitives. Like, that's how you actually get multi-threading, right? And obviously, the two things can align. So isolates was, has been our model for how you do multi-threading in Dart, and the idea has always been, at least in the beginning, is you have multiple completely separate heaps. Like the heaps are completely independent. Yep. And so, and you pass messages between them. And so you don't have any worry about coordination. So it comes up as a concurrent API. I can say, here, go do work, other thread, and send me an event with a send pork or something else. Let me know when you're done with your work. And I can go leverage all the cords I have on my machine. So I can spin up, you know, 16 isolates with 16 threads, and they'll go do work and let me know. The problem is there's a bunch of performance overhead because I have to copy all the data. As soon as you say I can share memory across threads, I don't have to worry about coordination and synchronization. You can get deadlocks. You can get, you know, even just incrementing numbers, weird things can happen. Like you have yeah. to have atomic operations. Yeah. But I think it's a good model to have. I remember coming from C Sharp 
And like every API you wrote in C Sharp, there'd be like this comment, which is like, safe for multi-threaded, safe for multi-threading. Yeah. Like you always had to think, oh, what about re -entracy? Like, <laughs> could many threads be calling my function, you know, mutating the data at the same time? You don't have to worry about that at all in Dart. What we realized is that's pretty limiting. <laughs> and so Slava has a proposal up. I really recommend people go look at the proposal. And so what it is, is it's an opt-in model where I can mark certain data structures, fields and classes or top level fields. I can mark them as, I think it's shared is the keyword or global. I think it's shared. And the idea is in a certain bit of code, I can say I am opting in to use shared memory multi-threading in this context. And this makes interopping with you know, other programming languages much easier because now I can align with a UI thread on iOS or Android and I can do multi-threading without having to copy everything, which is because those copies are expensive, especially if you're moving fast, right? So again, it's under proposal right now. It looks pretty cool what Slava's inventing. He's done a bunch of iterations on it later. I'd highly recommend, just like with any other language feature, there's an open issue on our language repo. It's dart-lang slash language under GitHub. So there's an open issue you can comment on, go read the proposal. I think it's gonna be an exciting place where we're going. Just, you know, again, like how do we find the places where we're not as fast as other things or we don't have the flexibility or the speed of other offerings? And like, how can we match that? while keeping all the benefits we have in Dart. And so I think he does a good job, and I'm curious to see what other people think. Yeah, I'm curious to see how that even looks because I'm just so used to the isolate model, and, and I, I like it. I mean, I haven't spun up so many isolates, or I haven't been passing lots of data in between that I, I've ever considered like, okay, this is a problem that I'm copying too much data. Right. For me, I'd rather copy the data and not have a deadlock issue rather than... Totally. I think the message passing model is a much safer model. And again, coming from languages before where you had to be so paranoid, yeah. like, oh, will this API ever be called in a multi-threaded context? And or will I ever have to worry about re-entrancy or other things in this API? Like, it's really gnarly once you get to that kind of code. And there's just a whole set of things I've never had to think about in Dart. And I like to keep it that way. While also... Just like you think about the unsafe keyword in Rust as an example, right? There are cases where you want an escape yeah. hatch. And so no, I understand. I'm curious to see how we do the escape hatch thing. You know, it'll be interesting to have, you know, mutex and lock and these other concepts or atomic increment. You know, these are some of the conversations that are happening right now. I guess we'll see what happens. It's still being designed. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to see, I don't know, how you would actually look at that. Because with Rust and stuff, I think you have something like an arc where you can automatic reference counted yeah. thing, you send a copy of well, it. Well, the Rust compiler does a lot of that work for you. Yeah, so ownership sure is how Rust makes sure. You know, having yeah. a very strong notion of ownership in language. But of course, there's a tax there. Like, you have to make the compiler happy. And so I don't think we're going to go in that direction with Dart, at least in yeah. the short term. Let's, not, let's um, let Rust do its thing and ex maybe there's, see if there's any ideas that can be used. Exactly. Or... So again, I'm not an expert here. I'm terrified if Slava listens to this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going for yeah. at least 65% correct of what I shared. I tell people, go read the, go read the docs. proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. We are kind of approaching the end of the time. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to mention or, because I think we covered quite a bit. I can clearly go on for a long time. It's really fun. You know, we just had our, our team summit where everyone got together in New York. People are asking me how big the Dart team is and the Flutter team. I can just say, like, we need to get a big room to get everyone in the same room. Like, it's a really yeah. big team. But we're super excited about the work we're doing. You know, we're working hard with our partnerships internally. You know, the Go team is now our sister team. It's been that way for a few years. So it's interesting kind of, you know, talking to Go and how we're handling things. We're really closely uh, aligned with Firebase and we're talking to them a lot about how we can align better with the offerings we have and just partners externally. Like I'm working with some really exciting companies that I would love to mention now. A year from now, hopefully I'll be able to say, you know that I made a reference, like we're working with really cool people that are investing in our ecosystem and we're working really hard at all layers of the stack, whether it's WebAssembly compiler or the multi-threading work in Dart or adding macros to Dart. And then at Flutter, like looking at 3D, looking at Impeller, looking at how we're targeting and doing a really good job with Interop, with Android and iOS. Like we're really firing at all cylinders and working and improving every layer in the stack. So it's a great time to be a Dart and Flutter developer. And I'm excited to see everybody online. So you can find me at my website is kevmoo.com, K-E-V-M-O-O.com. And that links to every social thing I do and talks I've done. So um, I'll link to this podcast when that goes live. So if you want to find me, I'm happy to engage with you on social media. And um, we'll see you on the internet. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you again. I think we're going to meet again for some weird reason. I, I hope so. <laughs> okay.